Welcome to How Not to DM. I'm your host, Derek. Thanks for joining me on my quest to interview the very best dungeon masters on this plane of existence. Before we get started, I need to shout out my newest patron, Joaquin of RPG Match. Thank you so much, you helped make the show possible. If you'd like to support the show, want a shout out on my next episode, or want an inside scoop on my upcoming guests, consider joining. You can find the link in my episode notes, my link tree, or by heading to patreon.com slash hn, the number 2, DM. Remember that 10% of my ad and patron money goes to support local LGBTQ plus youth via Encircle. Check out my link tree for more information. And now, on to this guest's episode announcement. Mike Shea, known as Sly Flourish, has been creating D&D content for years. From blogs to podcasts to video content to books and Kickstarters, he's just about done it all. Mike is best known for his Lazy Dungeon Master series, which has influenced hundreds of thousands of DMs to improve and streamline their game prep. Enjoy! So I got into D&D. I actually started with the Gold Box computer games back in the mid-late 80s, whenever those came out. I liked them, and I got kind of into the math behind them. I was like, why are armor classes negative numbers? And why are, you know, all this stuff going on? The branding worked. I had heard about D&D. I actually had a, a very good friend of mine, my oldest friend. And he was into D&D younger than I was. And I didn't really pay attention. And I always regret that I had not gotten into it when he got into it. Yeah. I got into it in high school. I picked up the player's handbook just so I could understand the gold box game. So I read the player's handbook and I liked that. And I said, you know, I'd like to get some of my friends together to play this. And I recruited some of my friends from high school and we got together and we played a campaign in the Forgotten Realms. It was really fun. We had a really good time. Then I went to school. I went to college and played a little bit in college, then got into Magic the Gathering instead and played that for a while. And then when I moved to Virginia, my girlfriend, now wife, played D&D, and I got back in with her and her friends. And then it was right at the beginning of fourth edition that I started wanting to write about it. I started the website Sly Flourish, named after the rogue ability, the rogue foray ability called Sly Flourish, and said that I was going to focus a blog on tips for dungeon masters to run better fourth edition D&D games. I've been listening to some bloggers who talked about, like, how do you make a good blog? And they were like, the more narrow, the better. Oh, okay. Well, I'll focus on fourth edition D&D DMs. That'll be my niche. And it worked out. I wrote a lot about it. I got Wizards of the Coast attention and wrote some fourth edition stuff for them as a freelancer. They connected me up with two good friends, Teo Sabadia and, and Scott Fitzgerald Gray, and continued to write that way. Then evolved from fourth edition to fifth edition when the edition changed and continued to keep writing. Started to write some books about it you know, with Sly Flush's Dungeon Master Tips and then the Lazy Dungeon Master and then a bunch of books after that. And then about four years ago, rewrote the Lazy Dungeon Master into Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, which got a lot of good attention and that yeah. worked out really well. And uh, yeah, been doing it ever since. Been doing about a book a year for about the last eight years, I think. Mm -hmm. That's a good pace. Not too much. And it still gives you some downtime, I'm sure. Not much, no. <laughs> not much. <laughs> pretty, pretty crazy. It's true. I mean, if you've got a day job and then this is, is yep. what you're doing on the side, not much. Yep. That's true. Yeah, a few of my guests have referenced specifically the Lazy Dungeon Master and the Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master as oh, a big great. thing for them that they've really used to help create an easy, fast framework for prepping their games. And it's something I kind of fell into as well. As I got more and more comfortable behind the screen, it was less like prep all of these different pieces and like try to make sure that every little thing is ready and more like I've thought enough about my world. I just need to do a few bullet points here and there. It's more of a process instead of me just kind of like picking and choosing a few different things I thought I should prep. And it's been very helpful. So the really big question I love asking people on this show and kind of the reason why I started it is because I love learning from other people's mistakes and trying to avoid them for my own games. So Mike, if you would share with us a few of your worst mistakes you feel like you've made, and they can be specific instances or they can be big overarching problems. And uh, what kind of lessons you feel like people can learn from those in their own games? I have lots of mistakes. <laughs> I get my best stuff from mistakes. A lot of what I write are really like me exploring this hobby. And then a lot of that comes from trying things out and having them not work. Inflexibility in a game, of course, is a common one. In fourth edition in particular, because fourth edition 
I think had a more kind of regimented style in the way it's run, mainly because uh-huh. battles take so long that I would have like, here's what I expect tonight's session to be like, here are the set piece battles that we're going to have tonight. And I expect that we're all going to go through them. And then like, they'd fly over one of them. And I'm like, man, I took like an hour <laughs> to set up that encounter. And you just flew yeah. over it. That one's pretty common though. I think a lot of people kind of face that and then sort of learn from that. Along with that, the antagonist DM mentality, the more tactical side of D&D, I think, exasperates this when it's an us versus them sort of style. And I know that I've had it where like my monster gets pinned down by some saver suck ability and I'm mad about it. Right. And then I like change the game to try to get around that. It's kind of a false wall because the DM can do whatever they want. Right. But you still have this feeling of like it's the DM versus the players. That's something that I think needs to be addressed by both DMs and players. Right. I've had players who were like, holding their cards close where you say something like well what do you want your character to do and they're like i don't know like what do you tell me and like why don't you just say it i i can't help you if you don't tell me what you're trying to do yeah so stuff like that i ran one game it was early on in a campaign we're just figuring our characters out an incident happened in the game that upset one of the players and we didn't know it because we're playing online i identified it relatively early but still too late Something upsetting had happened in the game, but the other players kind of doubled down on it. The jokes made it worse, not better. And the person felt like everybody's on board with this thing but me. We'd had safety tools in place, but it still wasn't fast enough. It still kind of got too far. And it helped me reinforce the safety tools that I used. A lot of people are like, well, for me and my friends, we don't have that problem. Well, this is a group I played with for 10 years. The player I've known for 20. It's not somebody that's brand new to the table. It's not somebody who's like crazy oversensitive in all these aspects of their life and can be triggered really easily with everything else. It was like somebody who played a long time, knew the game well, I knew well, we're all friends, and was still upset by this particular situation. It taught me that like they're really for every group. I'm, ne- I'm never going to say like a DM is bad if they don't do something, right? Or a DM is bad if they do. Like, we can all get to choose what we want to do. But I know like I really wish I had paid more attention because that would have been a night that would have gone better, right? And so that was a mistake that I learned from and now have reinforce it. Even when I'm playing with people I've played with forever, we still do a session zero. We still do lines and veils. We have a verbal X card, which I call pause for a minute. And this I find to be really handy. And it's handy not because it's a good verbal way to kind of stop a situation quickly, even if you're online, but we can use it for other things too, which is anytime you just want to break character. Anybody can say, let's pause for a minute and then step back. Are we cool with how this is going? And it doesn't have to be something that's emotionally traumatic. It can be Mm -hmm. just, we don't like the direction the story is going. So like I had a situation in my game last week where it's like the story took a massive turn and I was like, are we all good? And there was a, yeah, okay, game on. And it's just a really nice tool to use that can be used for something like a bad traumatic experience that's, that's kind of coming up, or it can be used just to make sure everybody's cool with what's going on. Really powerful tool. The third problem that I ran into was I ran a game that was probably my worst D&D game that I ran. And it actually had to do with the layout of the map. The map layout was really bad. And it was from an adventure that I think was actually a pretty terrible adventure. Part of it was the way that it was laid out where it had like a room that the characters would walk into and then like 10 rooms right around it where everybody can hear what is going on in the main room which means there's almost no way not to have 10 fights in like one circumstance. And then the very next part of it is a very long sloggy dungeon where you're getting hit by specters who are floating through walls and hitting you and you're running into traps. And it was so many downers that no one had a good time. I wasn't really enjoying running it. The players weren't having time playing it. And it was so bad that I said, you know what? I need to run this again with another group and see. And it sucked for them too. And I'm like, okay, you know, now I've got a good data driven test to show me, wow, it really is bad, right? It wasn't just a bad night or, you know, it's like, it's a terrible adventure. So yeah, that was probably, those are, those are kind of a few, a few circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you mentioned you've got people you've played with for 20 years and you still do lines and veils. You still do session zero because, and I don't think a lot of people consider this 20 years is a long time to live and to have tons of new experiences that they may not have shared with you, right? I've had some events in my life recently and, I, and I'm looking at things a lot differently. I notice things in like media and stuff and I'm like, that could be very triggering for someone who had dealt with something like this. And it's something that everyone should be considering. People have new experiences every day and you've got to make sure that you're being careful with them because uh, you never know what kind of stuff it could dredge up. So I love that. 
the older I'm getting, the more my tolerances are changing. There's things I don't want. As a DM, I say, these are the things I'm not going to do in this game, right? So we're all aware. Uh, On the flip side of this question is the good stuff that's happened. So what are some of your favorite memories from past games and what kind of made them so special for you and for your players? Also, was there anything you did to kind of influence it or was it just kind of the magic of tabletop games that caused these really memorable things to happen? I really love it when sort of improv really kicks up and that idea of yes and is really picking up and the story is getting better and better. And I think like running the beginning of my Wild Beyond the Witchlight game had some of this where the players were enjoying the characters. We made the characters together. We talked about how the characters met each other. I had a little bit of heavy handed, like here's the situation that your characters are in. But a lot of it was put together. And just the way that that played out has changed the rest of the campaign and made it so much more fun. And it was little things like we all determined that when we're going around figuring out what got stolen from them, my wife's character had her sense of time stolen from her. So she would lose track of time. You know, she could never schedule anything. The other characters all got met because they had met throughout the previous eight years because they all lost something at the same carnival. Something was stolen from them when they had visited this carnival when they were children. And somehow they all kind of put together this support group of people who lost stuff and said, we're all going to go back to that carnival when it comes back in eight years. And then through the bureaucratic discussions of who had what job as part of this organization, she ended up being the one who was going to schedule the time when they were going to meet with the carnival again. And everybody knew she has no sense of time, but because of the bureaucracy, they said, well, there's nothing we can do about it, right? She's the one that's in charge. And then she was a week late and missed the carnival. And that meant it was eight more years before they could meet the carnival the second time. (laughs) And then they said, okay, you're not in charge anymore, right? All of that just came out from the conversations of the characters. Like I didn't plan any of it. And still it had this really, oh, what if this happened? Oh, what if we did this? And that picked up through that whole first few adventures. It's picked up ever since. The characters' interaction with early NPCs have had big effects later. And that was just a delight. Watching the sort of improv of players playing off of each other and players playing off of the story and watching the story change because of the things they chose was just really great. (laughs) That's such a funny thing to have that person in charge of scheduling. Right, and that they knew it, right? Like they knew it was going to be a disaster. But just because of organizational bureaucracy... Well, we all have other jobs that we picked up. So I guess you're the one that's in charge. Oh, okay. That'll be fine. Right. And then they're a weekly. Yeah. <laughs> that's so funny. You kind of started running games, like you said, uh, after college as you moved to Virginia. Do you have any specific DMs that you really looked up to then? And then between then and now, are there any people that you've really enjoyed watching run games and kind of like tried to not emulate, but like you've noticed things they do that you try to pick up yourself? people you really look up to. One of the DMs that I play with, Janine Hempy is her name. And I just remember how she was an awesome DM. We've, I've played with her a few times now. And the way that she was able to just, I don't want to say like get control of all of the players, but steer all of the players towards the fun of the game. Like she knew the questions to ask each of the players to get us to introduce each other. Her pacing was great. I'll probably talk more about pacing. The way she paced the game was outstanding wonderfully confident and excellent DM so much so that like we seek her out the GM Tim who's on Twitter at the GM Tim uh, he's a professional dungeon master he runs games professionally and I had the opportunity to play with him at like a bar at one of the Gen Cons and wow just somebody that knows exactly how much rope to give you to really run free with the game and knows exactly when to pull it to get stuff back and remembers things like an incident early on was able to keep that in play in his game in particular we were all playing i think we we're playing kobolds or goblins and mm. we ran into a bunch of these like strange half lizard half chicken things we didn't know what they were and we managed to like defeat them and somebody grabbed one and stuck it in a bag and carried it for the whole rest of the adventure and it wasn't until the very end of the adventure where it had pecked through the bag and pecked the person and petrified them and we realized they were cockatrices He'd been carrying a bag full of a cockatrice for the whole game. Oh and none of us even knew, right? Like that we all, the way he described it was perfect. We didn't know it was a cockatrice until the end. And they're like, and they're like oh, that was a cockatrice, right? So yeah, who, who else? I had the, the absolute pleasure of playing in a game with James Intercasso, lead designer over at MCDM, Matt Colville's company, yeah. and wrote a lot of Wizards of the Coast books. One of the best people in this industry. He's just an awesome, awesome dude. 
And he's also, I guess unsurprising, an excellent dungeon master and ran the best 20th level game I've ever played in. We did a 20th level one shot playing in his adventure called Invasion from the Planet of Tarasks. And we got to fight Tarasks. And I think we <laughs> killed two, but we fought a whole bunch. Oh, he gets hard running 20th level games. Yes. But he knew how to keep the pacing of that game going really well. And the story was hysterical. I think it was the best D&D game I ever played in. Especially if you haven't been playing those characters from 1 to 20. No, like, these are all fresh. A bunch of new abilities. Yeah, it would be very tough to run that. Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> yeah, and it was just really, really fun. A delight to be able to play with him. And his patience for running six people with brand new 20th level characters in his game. And still keeping his energy so high that the game would never lost its pacing, never lost its speed. It was just a delight the whole time. Yeah, he's a very positive, happy guy. Yeah, love James. This episode of How Not to DM is brought to you by Gemmed Firefly. Need a fresh new look for the new year? Head on over to gemmedfirefly.com for the newest tees, mugs, and home goods styled with D&D gamer humor and aesthetics. As always, Gemmed Firefly makes every shirt to order, bringing you all of the softest and most comfortable shirts that thousands have come to love. And now, listeners of the show get a discount when you use the code DRAGON at checkout. Find your new favorite shirt at gemmedfirefly.com. And also, Fey Earth. Fey Earth is an indie TTRPG set in an alternate 19th century Earth, where the Fey have always lived alongside humanity, merging and colliding with the Industrial Age. The world of Fey Earth is filled with creatures whose names you have heard, but which are portrayed in an authentic way. Using a D20 system that is easy to pick up, Fey Earth is a world in which you can find hours of fun facing the fairies which scared and delighted you in fairy tales from childhood. Stay tuned for the Fey Earth Kickstarter coming this autumn. Check out links and socials on linktree.com slash Earth. That's F-E-Y-E-A-R-T-H. And last but not least, Delve Candles. At Delve Candle Company, we make immersive candles with custom blended scents that will add atmosphere and ambiance to your next game session. Our scents evoke settings or moods commonly encountered by adventuring parties, and our candles are 100% soy wax for a clean burning experience. Visit our website at delvecandles.com and subscribe to our mailing list for 10% off your next purchase. Adventure awaits for those who delve. And a note from Derek here, I've used Delve Candles recently and my players all loved it. I recommend trying the bag of scent holding pack to find scents that you love. And now let's return to the show, starting up with a brand new mini game for season two. This week on Quickfire Chaos, Mike and I are going to use the lazy dungeon master technique to prep for a random encounter we get from dice rolls. Okay, so next up is the mini game, and I've just kind of mixed it up for each individual guest to kind of like give them something to highlight part of their work or their skills. So I've outlined a party of four people, and what we'll do is we'll roll. I'll have you roll a D100 to pick a random city quest. Okay. Then I'll pick from one of these characters, one of their like goals that will tie in. We can kind of just hit that. That's the review the characters part. And then just like really quickly uh, off the top of your head, what kind of like strong start would you do? What kind of potential scenes might you put in for this? Sure. Cool. Yeah. If you would roll a D100 for me, we'll see what our quest is. These are city quests. 33. A mad alchemist set up a shop next to your favorite tavern. The whole establishment reeks of foul eggs and other unpleasant things. The tavern owner asks you to help convincing the alchemist to stop his work or leave. So we've got a party of four characters. We've got a rogue, a wizard, a barbarian, and a fighter. The wizard is particularly interested in alchemy. Uh, She is always looking for new knowledge. And she's kind of learned how to make a few potions here and there. So she might be an interesting tie-in. And then also, I'll say the barbarian has been looking for his missing son for a few years. And I feel like you could take one or two of those things if you want for the review characters. Okay, so we're going to use the lazy dungeon master method here. We've got eight steps of... Yep, 
It's eight. Yeah, eight, eight steps. Okay, I was like, <laughs> did I miscount? Eight yep. steps. But we got uh, seven to... left because you kind of reviewed the characters a little bit. So we probably... Yes. Uh, I wanted probably to give you one, something. Because yeah. if we're just making up characters, then it would take forever. So sure. there's some review the characters. That works. Uh, yeah. And that's good From stuff. There. Some good, they're good hooks in there. Having, having yeah. a character who's into the alchemy and likes mm-hmm. this and the barbarian that's, that's looking for their lost son. Both, I think, yeah. are excellent hooks that we can play with here. The strong start is easy. The wall of the bar explodes. Okay. From the alchemy side, great oozes start floating into the bar and eating people. Okay. A bunch of people are trying to enjoy their afternoon drink. The wall explodes and great oozes start attacking people. And the bartender goes, oh, not again. And shouts in <laughs> exasperation. They're like, oh, again. The party's in the bar. They're in the bar and the yeah. wall explodes. And now, and, all right, so they can get involved and fight some great oozes. So that way you got a good start to the whole thing. So they have to fight the oozes. And then they, of course, are like, what's going on here? You can kind of decide, like, okay, well, what are the scenes that take place after that? Well, I think, like, confronting the alchemist and be like, you know, the bartender hires the characters to go deal with this situation. Hey, I've dealt with this guy before. He's a pain in the ass neighbor, right? You got to deal with it. <laughs> the guy's juiced in, right? The guy's got, like, relatives in the council mm. where they can't get rid of the alchemy, right? And the alchemist is like, I told you to reinforce that wall. You clearly didn't. So, really, this is your fault, right? And, you know, bad zoning, up to code. right, yeah. building us up to code, bad zoning, <laughs> right? And so you can have a lot of fun with that. You know, you want to create a fun situation, like the bartender wants the characters to either maybe break into the alchemist place in order to try to learn more about what he's doing over there. That's clearly against policy, right? Clearly against the city code. Or there's some negotiation that has to take place with local law enforcement. Maybe all of this has to happen. I guess the only hook that I would try to do in here is how is the barbarian's son involved? Right. Maybe the barbarian's son once worked for the alchemist, but didn't come back from the alchemist place. So there somewhere. Mm. And maybe it's not it's so sinister. The alchemist's son actually does work there still, but has been down in the labs all this time or something like that. Oh, right. and so the wall kicks down. The gray uses come and the barbarian's like, that's my son, like on the other side of the wall. Like- you do something <laughs> like that, right. So I think one of the, you know, when you go through and I think like the big one are like secrets and clues. Like what are the secrets mm. and clues? So you'd want something like the alchemist has actually replaced the town politicians with mimic versions of the politicians. Why has the alchemist been able to keep this going? The alchemist might have a secret lab that's got other politicians that are in tubes that are being slowly built like pod people. So you could have lots of fun sort of secrets like that. And that would be a good example of the fantastic location. Yeah. Well, so the location would be like all the various pieces of the lab, but you could have another location of the council hall. Like what makes the council hall fantastic? huge statue of the lord who once ran the place or stained glass windows that move or something right that, like, the whole thing is on a hill but it's all floating above the hill like all the chamber seats are floating above it so you want to make it kind of like you know oh yeah i see what that's like but it's also really cool mm-hmm. and then the secrets are all the weird things that the alchemist might be up to and then treasure is easy right there's tons of potions and scrolls and other weird oddities that somebody could find their magic items that the alchemist had so you could do that npcs would be of course the alchemist the bartender the politicians and then monsters are your whole flavor of various oozy type monsters you can pretty much make any monster an ooze creature you can just sort of give it the ooze template you can make up an ooze template and apply it to anything so if you wanted like an ogre there's probably appropriate cr but if you wanted like ogre oozes these could be like the weird mimic creatures that the alchemist has built that are forming big tough ogres right and you just take an ogre stat block and say it's an ooze ogre you don't really have to tie too much mechanics to it and it'll still mm-hmm. work out. Maybe it can squeeze under doors, you know, something really weird. Yeah, they drop from the ceiling or something because they're like yeah. stuck on it or whatever. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. A lot of ways you could do that. Probably need a little bit more than that to uh, run an adventure, but maybe not much, right? I think I could have fun with that. Yeah, that'd be at least a few sessions worth, I think, of chasing down all of the leads and figuring it out. I think that hits all the steps. Yeah. So as part of your work, you kind of mentioned you've gone to a lot of conventions and that kind of thing. Uh, So tell us uh, some of the favorite things you've gotten to participate in or do after having started to produce tabletop uh, role-playing game content. You know, what have been some highlights of your career, I guess you could say? Probably number one was being able to take a month off from my day job to write Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. It was my best professional month that I've ever had in my life. And It was great to have like a routine. I didn't have to worry about anything that was going on at work because I was going to be gone a whole month. I wasn't busy with other things, so I could just focus on the book. And every morning for like four hours, roughly, was writing. And afternoon was four hours of research. And it was really delightful. 
it was just great. And I think the book was better because of it. I think being able to focus my time and attention on the book, I read like every dungeon master's guide or game master's guide I could get my hands on. I read every book of advice that I could get my hands on. That was a wonderful experience. So I was very lucky to have a company that lets me do that. Very lucky to have the resources where I could take a month unpaid and, and work on something like that. For return, it worked out. It earned more than, <laughs> than it cost me to take the month off. So that was really great. Just being able to focus like that was really awesome. The other notable time was when, again, through just serendipity, one of the producers of D&D, a fellow named Greg Bilsland, hired myself and Teo Sabadia and Scott Fitzgerald Gray to all work together on a project called Vault of the Dracolich. And it was the first fifth edition published adventure before fifth edition had come out. It was a D&D next adventure yeah, designed for multiple tables to all play together towards one big scenario. And the collaborative experience of working with Teos and Scott all together, like this was an experiment for wizards. Typically what they did is they hired a writer, the writer would write it, it would go to a developer who would make sure that like all your mechanics and the crunchy bits would work, and then would go to an editor who would clean it all up. And in this mm -hmm. case, they said, we kind of want all three of you working on it at the same time. And it was great. We're proud of the product, but mostly it was because I got to meet Scott Gray and Teos Avidia and work closely with them. And they're just two outstanding people. I was just talking to them before the show. Those have been relationships that have held for the last 10 years or however, eight, seven or eight years that we've been talking together since. So that was wonderful. The other one was a very similar project that was more self-started, which was working on Fantastic Layers, the book I did before The Companion, again, with Scott Fitzgerald Gray, who's again, worked on everything I've done, and James Intercasso. The three of us did the same kind of thing where we pitched each other on all the layers. I think we had 40 or 50 layers and we'd pitch each other on them and then rank our own layers. Like, which ones are we excited? And in some cases, like James would pitch a layer and I'm like, that's great, but I'm writing that. You're not writing that, <laughs> you know, and I'll give you, I'll trade you the mummy Lord for your vampire guy. A few times where like I would pitch one and James is like, I want to do that one. We're like, great. That was really cool. And then a bunch of stuff hit the cutting room floor, which I think is a very good part of the creative process of, yeah. you know, we shipped our best ideas, not all of the ideas. And that whole experience is great. We worked on it for a year. It's an outstanding book, if I do say so myself. It's a beautiful book. The layers are solid. We play tested the hell out of them. Beautiful artwork, great maps, 23 layers from first level to 20th level. All of us couldn't be more proud of and people have definitely loved. I actually just listened to the DMnastics episode where you were talking to Neil and Celeste about this, which is funny because that happened two years ago, but I was listening and I was like, <laughs> oh, I'm going to talk to Mike tomorrow, literally. Like, yeah, that's kind of funny. You mentioned there uh, part of the problem it solved is people don't often look for lots of little encounters, but they do like boss encounters take a long time to put together. Yeah, they're hard. Right. And so that book, like, even if it's just an inspiration, you at least have like yep. a really cool location or a really cool monster. And you can kind of pick and choose and put those wherever you want. Yeah, that was exactly it. trying to keep them modular so that you could just sort of grab them and drop them in. From an experience perspective, just being able to work with people of that caliber for that long on a project that we all were on board with. Like we, the interesting thing, like we didn't know what we were going to write when we got together, right? We just said, we want to work together on something. We actually pitched a bunch of ideas about what we'd work on and kept and killed some of those and then came back to that experience again. That's awesome. You've talked uh, a lot in the past in various different places about dials as a DM and kind of using and turning these dials one way or the other during a game or before a game. Talk to us about what that means and kind of what you're talking about and how a smart dungeon master uh, uses these dials to improve the game. The specifics of the dials is that it relates to combat challenge and monster, specifically things you can do with monsters. I always try to boil things down to like simple heuristic tools we can keep in our heads. You don't need to do anything complicated. And there's certainly lots of interesting philosophical things when we can talk about D&D, &D, but there's also like What's a practical thing that you can just keep on hand and use that helps you with your game? So I try to focus on those a lot. Dials are yeah. an example. I kind of see it as four dials that exist for monster difficulty. The number of monsters that are in a battle, uh, how many hit points those monsters have, the number of attacks that the monster can dish out, and the amount of damage that those attacks do. The interesting thing is some dials are kind of visible to the players and other dials really aren't. And knowing when to twist which dial and what, which dial to turn and why is where some of the tricky bit is. I don't promote turning the dials to like stick it to the player. You don't use the dials for revenge. You use the dials because you want the game to feel 
better than it might be feeling otherwise if you didn't turn. I feel like the dials have resistance to them. They're not free floating dials. They steer towards the average. And if you let them go, they will pop towards the average. In many cases, you might not have to twist them at all. In many cases, like the average works fine. Number of attacks, the amount of hit points, all that works fine. But every so often you're like, yeah, but I know my characters are really tough and I want this battle to feel challenging. So I'm going to have to turn some of them. A couple of those dials you can turn ahead of time. And that way they are relatively invisible to the players. And that's the number of monsters. Like if you turn the monster dial, you can't just have more monsters pop in like they came out of nowhere. Yeah, it depends, right? Like you may have another room where where stuff comes in, but like big monsters or whatever. Yeah, it's it's tough to kind of like, oh, all of a sudden another dragon showed up. Yeah, exactly. All of a sudden another dragon shows up. You can sort of keep the dial in mind when you're designing the encounter and say to yourself like, well, what if when the monster reaches half its hit points, if they are having a really easy time, I'm going to bring in four fire elementals instead of two, right? Mm-hmm. And so if you have like a staged battle, you can, you can have it. And you can say like, depending on how I feel, it might be two, it might be four, however I deal with it. So that's one way to use like the number of monsters dial. The hit point, the interesting thing is that the hit point dial and the damage dials by Wizards of the Coast's own descriptions are intended to be dials that mm-hmm. the hit points you know jeremy crawford talks about this on numerous podcasts that he's been on he talks about the fact that the hit points of a monster is the average of its hit type and you are free to turn it to the bottom of that number or the top you're still technically within the challenge rating of the monster really you, you can't be because a monster that's like you know one fourth of its normal hit points or four times its hit points is a significantly different challenge mm-hmm. I feel like DMs should feel free to turn that dial. And that's another one where you might keep the range in your mind and say, I know that upper max of this monster is 40, but the average is only 22, uh, you know, like a ghoul or something like that, right? I'm going to keep it at 22, but like if I need to, I can always move it up to 40. And again, you want to really ask why. Most of the time, I would say the hit point dial is turned down to make the battle speed up and get over with quickly a cardinal sin i have seen many dms do is the well let's just call the battle right here they break character and they say you guys have it we're gonna move on and you're like you did it right at the point where we were getting the advantage in the battle i want to finish it i want the joy of knocking down the rest of these guys and i get why they do it time is a factor but a way to treat that time is turn that dial down and the next hit is killing things right so that hit point dial can be used for a lot then there are times where you say like you know, characters are dishing out so much damage that these monsters that should be fun and challenging for the story aren't going to be. That's not a bad reason to turn the hit point dial up a little bit, right? But you can sort of choose. Some DMs take this to the extreme of, I don't even bother tracking hit points. I just let monsters die when they die. I'm not going to knock them for that. They can do whatever they want to do. I don't quite treat it that fluidly. I, I always try to keep the numbers generally in mind, but I know where they're coming from. And I think where they're coming from is the same philosophy. Make it, make it yeah. interesting. Damage and attack dials, same kind of thing. You can always increase the damage. There's some ways you can do it in narrative. There are some monsters, frankly, there's a fair bit of monsters that hit under their challenge rating to begin with. One of the ones I was just thinking about is like the white, you know, the CR2 white. Doesn't hit for enough damage. The reason why it's so high in its challenge rating is because its normal slam attack can drain life. The mm-hmm. problem is that the slam attack isn't really as good as its longsword attacks. You're losing the advantage of, like, if it attacks with its longsword twice, it's not fighting at the challenge rating it's marked at. You can just add damage to it and be like, when it attacks with a longsword, yeah, it does six slashing, but I'm also going to add 2d6 necrotic. And now it's scary, right? Now a white is scary. I like that idea. And you could say, like, his sword is glowing with black fire. And you're like, uh oh, what's right. that, right? And he hits you and he just, you know, you take six piercing, but seven necrotic and like oh that's what that black fire is so you can change that and then the number of attack styles that one's also pretty invisible you can either turn that one up or down and say give monsters extra attack if their action economy is too low an ogre like let's say you're fighting one ogre and you're fighting level three characters you might give that ogre a second attack and now it's matching up to its action otherwise it's just going to miss with an attack and never do anything right and you got four attacks from right uh, level three players yeah it'll just get wiped and something i've been playing with is the idea of like attack again on a miss, which is sort of like adding an attack. But the idea is when a monster attacks and misses, it gets another free attack. It wouldn't get another free attack if it hit. Uh, And that means the damage won't be too high 
Because you're not attacking twice when you right. hit. It's just when it misses. That's called advantage, Mike. <laughs> right? Right? And that's kind of true, except how it's described in the game. The way it's described in the game is the ogre takes a big swing with his miss, misses, roars out, and attacks again. Is different than if it had advantage in narrative. Mechanically, it's pretty much the same thing as advantage. But narrative, I think it can be different. It's kind of like an action surge. A little bit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The nice thing about that dial is like, if you don't want your ogre to be overpowered, because it's like it's going to hit the same guy twice and do 20 points of damage and just knock out your level three character. You might have it where only it's going to hit more often, but it's still only going to be doing its base damage. It's like a little clicker that sits on that damage dial. So I've been playing with that. I've been using it and I like it. There's certain monsters that hit way over their CR where I was like, okay, if that guy hits twice with his thing, he's going to just destroy characters. So I'm going to say he will only attack with that second attack if he misses the first. Right. And that way the damage is scaled a little bit better. It's still a threat. He's still going to do something, but it's not going to just knock people out with one hit Hmm. or two hits. Would you give that ability to a character? They've got their own mechanics, right? And they have so many different things. Uh, One thing I do give characters, I start everybody out with inspiration. That way I don't have to think about it. Like everybody begins with inspiration uh, and they can use it. And I will let them choose to add inspiration even after they've rolled. So instead of them saying, I'm going to use my inspiration on this before and then get advantage on it. I will let them do it a second. It still counts as advantage. So they can't do that and advantage. I don't want people to waste it. Usually they get one a game, right? And I don't want them to use their one inspiration a game. And then, you know, I rolled 19s. I should have saved it. I would rather them use it when they know it's going to be valuable. Now, if they roll it and they'd still suck, well, that's them's the dice, right? So that's a little bit of like offering that sort of idea to a character. I typically don't change mechanics on the character side. It's rare when I have to change up the house rules on the character side. They've got their whole system sort of wired. Yeah, I found it's pretty similar. I know there's popularly like rules about potions taking bonus actions or whatever. I've played in a game where the DM allowed that. I have not included that house rule in my game. I have included others and then kind of got rid of them because I'm like, I don't really need them. The game's playing just fine. And I thought that it was going to be a bigger deal. And the funny mm-hmm. thing is like bonus actions, at least with my character, are so overburdened anyway. There's so many different options for bonus actions that it's yeah. not really changing much. Especially higher level play, I think that's the case as well. So yeah, if you had to boil down, to use your phrase, maybe like one or two specific pieces of advice for DMs out there, what would those two pieces of advice be? I'm going to pick two. And one of them I'm going to steal from Money Cook, although I think that it's, you know, I've written about it a lot and I think it's really important, which is really try to actively understand the importance of pacing. Pacing can make or break a game and it's not something we pay a lot of attention to. Some of pacing is like making sure that the action is staying high, making sure that the characters are engaged, making sure everybody's got something to do. It's knowing when things need to speed up a little bit and when things need to slow down. It's also a matter of the beats, right? I talk about this in Return. This comes from Robin Laws, this idea of upward and downward beats in games that you can keep people engaged by having an oscillation of good things and bad things happening. Too many good things and it gets boring and stale and too many bad things and it gets frustrating and you break out. You're like, why is the DM punishing me? So when I talked about one of my big mistakes of running that dungeon that had all traps and specters, that was all just downward beats. It was like hard fights, followed by getting specters draining your life, followed by you running into dumb traps, right? And it was too much. And I'm like, if the wall had broken through and they found a room to take a long rest, boy, they'd have been happy. Or if they managed to pick something up, like a dead cleric had a holy symbol that was able to cast a free turn on dead that anybody could use, and it could blow those specters away. Wow, that would have been great. So that oscillation of good and bad beats is important. And there's some tricks that we can do to do that, like, If you look at your game saying, what are some upward beats I can drop into my next session? Or if they're going through a particular area, what are some upward beats that make sense for that? And what are some downward beats that make sense for that? And then you improv them. You don't plan them. You say like, have we had a lot of bad things happen? Maybe it's time for a good thing to happen. And that number of monsters dial we were talking about earlier, that is upward and downward beats. Turn it to the left where it's very few monsters. And that's an upward beat because it's so easy to beat. Turn it all the way to the right with lots of monsters. And now it's a downward beat because it's a real heavy challenge. Oscillating between easy and hard fights is a a way to do pacing too. But pacing also includes like knowing when to make your shopping episode move faster or knowing when to, you know, sure, somebody might be real interested in a particular scene, but maybe not everybody is. How do you move that along? It is hard. Nobody's perfect at it. 
and we could spend our whole lives getting better at it. But it's something worth paying attention to. It's something worth thinking about when you're running your game. It's thinking about when you're planning your game. How are you going to keep things moving so that there's always something exciting going? That's on pacing. I would say my second one I hinted at too. It's probably bleeding into that becoming cliche kind of thing. But I know lots of DMs who don't do it. That's really being a fan of the characters first. This is a concept that you can find in Dungeon World. Dungeon World is really the first game I played that really like hammered that into me and made Mm. me think differently about how I ran games. It's that idea of like, you don't want to be an antagonist DM. It's not us versus them. It's not the DM versus the players. I really try to think of it like the DM isn't setting up situations. The DM is exposing the story that's happening, clarifying that story. But this gets very sort of metaphysical. Stephen King talks about like, you know, we're plucking the stories out of the air, right? Like we don't control them. They control themselves and we're just along for the ride. But there's something to that idea, (laughs) right? There's something to the way of thinking about it that way. And I talk about it. My players always roll their eyes when I'm like, look, I'm just an antenna, right? I'm just a vehicle for storytelling. (laughs) What's happening here is what's happening, right? That's not, I'm not. They're like, you pulled the mini out of the drawer. What are you talking about, right? Like you bought that mini. Right? No, no, this is just a Tarrasque. I don't know. Why. But there's something about thinking that way, right? And remembering that like it, you and the players are there together looking at the story, thinking about that story. I know a lot of DMs where like, they think their goal is challenge the characters, challenge them, right? But the problem is that can quickly become an antagonist situation where it's players versus DM. And, mm-hmm. and I've certainly seen it where people say, it's not worth me spending an hour in Roll20 to set up a situation with dynamic lighting to fight two hobgoblins with a party of third level characters. And you're like, yeah, but how much fun is that? Right. They might not even kill them. Right. They might just have a conversation with them. And they're like, if I'm going to bother to spend an hour setting up my dynamic lighting in world 20, it's going to be a hard fight. That means they're always running hard fights. That's something where I think there are other ways. Find faster ways to run fights like that. Too many hard fights can turn into that antagonist situation, right? They can turn into a situation where the DM is really putting themselves behind the monsters a little litmus test for this, a little trick that you can do that's kind of, how do you feel when the monster crits? Do you feel good or do you feel bad? Or, you know, are you torn? And if you're torn, you're in a good state, right? Constantly torn. Yeah, if you feel good about it, well, maybe that's, something's different, right? Same way, like, if a monster makes a saving throw against a character's ability, how do you feel about it? And I'll tell you, like, something where I changed, particularly, I've been thinking about this idea called lightning rods. And a lightning rod is an idea that when you build up a fight, if you're building up a big boss fight or something like that, you're putting monsters in specifically designed to eat the powerful abilities of characters. Not because you're trying to screw a character over, but because you want them to look cool. And there's basically two different kinds of lightning rods. Great big juicy monsters with crappy wisdom and charisma scores that don't have legendary resistances. And hordes of small dudes with less than 28 hit points who love to run in a radius that's exactly the size of a fireball. And you throw lots of these out there because it's like, oh, it's so much fun, right? But you feel bad if you're like, oh, I cast Banish on that rock. A rock is a great, the big bird, right? A rock is a fantastic lightning rod because it has like 250 hit points and it hits for like 50 damage, but its charisma score is like eight. It is a perfect thing to banish. So if they cast Banish and they miss, you should feel bad, right? <laughs> you should be like, I wanted you to ban it because now you're hosed, right? Now you got to fight that thing. And like, I guess we're going to have to cast Banish again. A level of maturity that I have reached is when my monsters crit, I'm not happy about it. And when my monsters fail their saving throws, I feel bad. I wanted the players to succeed because it was going to be cool for them to pull off their stuff. That's certainly a change for me and how I've approached D&D over the years. But one that I'm now happier. I'm happier with a game now than I've ever been. I'm definitely still working on it, probably more in the conflicted camp these days. Sure. But yeah, it's definitely something I aspire to. Yeah, like we want to see our monsters do cool stuff, right? Right. So there's also that. Like it sucks if you have like a, I had a mind flare who used a psionic blast, hit the whole party and everybody made their save. And it's like, oh, like, you know, and then they killed him. They killed him the next round, right? I told the whole this narrative about him coming out and I was like, I should have used two mind flares. (laughs) I had a bunch of bards um, that were performing for uh, travelers along a road who would like basically put the audience to sleep and rob them and everyone passed their sleep save. And so no one (laughs) fell asleep and I couldn't like even, yeah, that was, that was a little disappointing, but you know, it's okay. Right. It's a story, right? That's, that's how it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone else fell asleep, like all the, you know, the random people on the road, but my party didn't. So yeah, but that's okay. They got to be the heroes and save the day. And that's the point. 
to wind things down here, Mike, you mentioned you've got a, an upcoming project in June, but it sounds like either you're not sure what it is yet or you can't tell us, but any other upcoming kind of projects, anything coming up that you want to tell us about? I have been working on a project for my Patreon called the City of Arches. The way I've been treating my Patreon is I've been writing projects over a long period of time and giving them pieces of it regularly. Mm -hmm. A lot of the material that's in the Lazy DMs Companion, for example, started off as Patreon pieces, which is great because I get immediate feedback on it. Patrons get to get access to it right away and it grows and the patrons keep what they get. It's not like I pull it down. So City of Arches is another one of these where I wanted to build a city that was really a good, fun hub for adventure that was a positive, upbeat place that had reasons for any possible character race to be there. So I started off the city and I've been expanding that every month. It's now about a 20-ish page PDF. For the first time, I've been commissioning art specifically for the Patreon product. Chloe Ballard has been doing cartography for it. Two beautiful maps. One is a really cool overland map and one is a side view, like a classic, you know, sort of one mm, of those classic skyline. side view maps that shows all the weird stuff underneath the city only with crazy detail in it. Okay, yeah, yeah. Like a horizontal slice of the city and then... Like the iceberg kind of... Yeah, exactly. Like the iceberg thing. All the weird places to explore underneath. So that has been a really fun thing to work on. Every month I've been adding pieces to that. So that's been great, yeah. And then I've got another project that, yeah, I'm not not, not yet ready to talk about, but probably the thing I'll be spending most of my... June. Only because like we don't want to disappoint people. We're like, ah, oh, we decided we're not going to do that. Uh, when this episode comes out, you'll probably have either announced or your announcement should be coming soon. So everybody be on the lookout for that. All right. Uh, where can people find your work, Mike, as we end the show here? Best place is to go to slyflourish.com. That's sort of the hub of everything that I do. At the top is like, if you want the big areas where you can find things that I make, best bet is subscribe. I have a newsletter. All the articles that show up on the blog show up as weekly or sometimes twice weekly articles to your inbox. So that's really great. You get a nice free PDF too for Adventure Builder there. So that that's one. Uh, I have a new bookstore uh, up on the Sly Flourish mm -hmm. website. You can go to the bookstore and pick up any of my books. All seven books are up there in uh, PDF format and then links to get them in, in print and things like that. My YouTube channel, which is also available. You can Sly Flourish blog. There's a the little YouTube link that takes you to all my YouTube videos. I'm doing about two to three videos a week. Uh, I do a one hour talk show. I do a some lazy DM prep where I actually use return like we did just now. I yep, use it yep. for my own game. And, and I like to show uh, I like to show how this stuff is. And it's a great opportunity to do that. And then I usually have like a DM tip or something like that once a week that I that I post. There's a podcast version as well. The longer shows that I do in YouTube are also turned into a podcast so people can subscribe to that. So those are kind of the big ones. Um, yeah. Yeah. The Patreon yeah. that I mentioned is, is yeah, another another good place to reach me. Yeah, you, you've done a lot of prep videos and, and podcasts and articles of, of a lot of the popular modules, too. So if people want yep. to go see your process and, and kind of look at your notes, you know, while while uh, they're prepping the same game, then they can. So, all right. Well, thanks so much for joining me, Mike. It's been a lot of fun. Like I said, uh, I've used a lot of your stuff in my own games. It's made them a lot better. And uh, a lot of the concepts you talk about, like things that I've kind of noticed myself, and then you put it into words a lot better than I could. So really great resources and uh yeah it's been a lot of fun chatting pleasure's been all mine thank you thank you for listening to how not to dm now it's time for a sneak peek into next week's guest cad kruger of d20 dames because i was still a new dm i hadn't experienced the over planning for one thing and then not planning at all for another thing <laughs> and one of the things was i named every single one as a kobolds that they were gonna face i had like a staff room with lockers with all of their names on it yeah they never went into that room however the gnomes that they were there to save they asked every single name to hear more from Kat about her DMing advice and work in the industry, tune in next week. Remember to check out my Patreon if you haven't already for even more sneak peeks. Next time you get the chance, share this episode with your friends and family around your game table. Another great way to help me boost the show is by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or by rating the show on Spotify. I appreciate all of you for helping me grow. Thanks to the team at T4C Studios for helping edit and produce this episode. My new intro and outro music is by Daniel Zombo. The Quickfire Chaos music is by Exacat, and the Quickfire Chaos mood music is by Arcane Anthems. Check out the episode notes for more of their great work. 
And as always, until next time, roll some nat 20s for me.